Okay. Where's Michael Danger Batnick? Look at this. What an entrance. There I am. What an entrance. Welcome to What Are Your Thoughts? People returning. You guys know what time it is. People who have not been here yet. We're going to have a lot of fun tonight. Oh, wait. All right. Uh, I was told that I'm giving shout outs to only the last people to join the live chat because I'm lazy and that's what's in front of me. So I'm going to remedy that situation. Uh, Casey, you were first. Happy birthday. Lurking Carol, what's happening? Hawking1969. Francisco, you are early today. Brian Grill, Neil Griffin, part time Larry, we love you. Uh, who else is here? All right, I think Christopher Caslin, what's happening? Phil McCann, how are you? All right, we have so much to do tonight, and the first thing we obviously going to get into is market volatility and what's driving it, and finally, finally, it feels like something's going on. But before we do that, let's give a shout out to Y Charts, best sponsor in the world. You guys know how much we love Y Charts. You're about to see a ton of Y Charts tonight. We use them for all our data, all our charting needs. If you want to check out uh, Y Charts yourself and it's your first time, there's a registration link below us and a discount because you guys are cool and you watch. What are your thoughts? All right. Music off. Almost chart on. Mike, we're going to talk about yield screaming higher, but do you feel like we should set the, the stage first with a little bit of, of data for people who haven't been staring at this stuff all day? Nah, no state. Let's just get right to it. Okay. Kidding. Set the stage. What you, set the stage. Set it. Okay. Well, you may. I I asked you for a chart of like everything. <clears throat> John, throw up this every throw up this everything chart. It's Duncan, by the way. Oh, Dun John's, John's, not John's here? in Portugal. John's in Portugal. He's globe globe trotting. Mm, good for him. All right. Uh, what are yields like in Portugal? Duncan, thank you for doing this. We uh we're looking at the ten year Treasury rate, guys. The only thing that matters here is the very far right. Like the <laughs> like the last week and a half when it when it when it seemed as though oh finally uh, yeah, German, we have liftoff. The German tenure is screaming higher. It's negative thirty six basis points. But from where? You know, honestly, uh -huh. chart off. I take umbrage with the screaming higher nonsense. <laughs> screaming higher one, relative four? to last week. Relative to last week. No, but it is though. But it is though. All right, let's do it this way. The tenure is at a ninety day high, okay. highest since the summer started. Do you know what that mm -mm -mm -mm. coincides? Oh yeah, since summer. You're right. You're right. Go, go, since go June. On, go on. Go on. Do you on. know what that coincides with? Has nothing. To, has nothing to do with the Fed. Nothing to do with taper. It coincides is, with Delta. One hundred percent coming down. That's what's. That's what's going on. Yields crashed again when Delta turned out to be a way bigger deal than we thought it would be. And the Fed was going to uh, remain accommodative. Blah blah blah. Yeah. Okay. So so that kind of seems like. It's uh, fading in the rear view, not that Delta's over, but the acceleration of Delta. And now all of a sudden, yields are ripping, and we're worried about tech stocks, which I guess are long duration well, this is, we, we, uh, we, assets. We, we, we saw this movie before. You know, there's a saying in Texas, I think they have it in Tennessee, fool me once, can't get fooled again. In, in why March- that, Wait, why is that from Texas? That was, that was a, I was quoting Bush. Remember he did that? Um, George oh. W. Way yeah. over my head. Okay, go on. <laughs> All right. Uh, in, Mar in March and April, we, had, we, we saw interest rates rise quite significantly, very fast, pretty much straight up. Yeah. Tech sell off bigly. And the story of the time was long duration assets, to your point, Josh. All of these companies that are promising future cash flows, five, 10, infinity years out into the future, if the discount rate is zero, well, then a dollar a dollar in 30 years is the same as a dollar today, no big deal. Yeah. But if you don't need to reach 30 years into the future and you could get cash flow today when interest rates are rising, so cyclical stocks, which we're about to talk so about, you've just, then it so makes- you've just defined you've just defined what we mean by long duration asset. So things like, that pay you back way into the future. Right. So a technology company saying we're gonna lose money for the next five years, don't worry. There will be a lot of earnings way in the future. When it's competing with a positively yielding bond, all of a sudden, it's tougher to justify paying 500 times sales for it. So that's basically what, you're, what, what we're saying, right? Yeah, and pe people can quibble with the fact that like, all right, give me a break. The 10 years at 1.5, does it really matter if it's at 90 basis points? Listen, I don't know. Yes. If, enough, if, if enough people think it matters, it matters. Directionally, it matters. 
forget about the level today. The level is not the thing. It's the thing with treasury bonds is never the level. It's always the speed at which it moves and the direction it's moving. And the level, throw it out. The level's a reflection of our yeah, that, of, of the, the life and times we live through. I think that's a good point. So, so, so if people are scoffing at like, oh, 1.5% is that, I think you're right. I think it's it's the direction. The level is not is not significant. So we've got some we've got some COVID charts, some good mm. COVID charts. John, yes. uh, Duncan, throw up this one. So the blue is the number of daily cases and the red is the trend line, is the smooth. And thank God it's going, it, it spiked and, and this rates is via fell. Bank of America? Is that, is uh, that this? No, I, I threw that one out. This is a better visual. This so one's rate, better. Okay. So, so Delta was coming back. COVID was, was spiking. Rates fell. Tails were winning by a landslide. So, so you love to see this. So I want to throw up, what is that? Oh, was that a, is that a Shania I don't know. Joke? It sounded like that's where you were going. It, it, it's from, it's from Rocky four. I want to say, wait, can you put that char chart on chart on yeah. chart on? Do you see this period of time? Do you see this period of time? Like two weeks ago when we were peaking out, like that was a good time to buy value stocks and cyclicals and the oil stocks started to rip. And for me, those are the best tells in the market right now about all this virus related shit. What do you think? Yeah, about I mean, that? We we didn't, I think you're right. We didn't know they were peaking, but in right. hindsight, yeah. So, so a few things. There was a poll, I forget, I don't know who exactly was asked, but is a balance of risk to economic growth through 2021 chart off to the upside or the downside? 58% said to the downside. Naturally, I mean, that's pretty much what it's always going to be. 60% said the risk is to the upside. But the next, the next one is, is the one that's more telling. So the biggest risk that people saw is- Wow, look at this. Is a variant of the, is COVID. Yeah. So Mike, so let me let me give people some sense of what's going on and why all of a sudden we're we're piling into cyclical stocks, value stocks, and selling the long duration because rates no longer look to be justified to be heading back to zero with endless stimulus. If we get this virus thing under control, and it seems like we are, um, so here are the the COVID nineteen updates. U.S. daily cases. This is via Bank of America. Continue to fade. 122,000 uh, average daily cases, which is 25% below the high from right after Labor Day. That's a big change. In the E5, which is the largest companies in Europe, they're at 53,000, which is 42% below the highs that they reached two months ago. They're a little bit ahead of us. Globally, the seven-day average is under half a million, which is a 14% decrease from a week ago. And last thing, uh, the seven-day average of COVID-related fatalities was 8,000 yesterday. I feel like the globe could handle 8,000 COVID deaths a day. Like, it's not it's not good. We don't want any. But there are, like, probably 8,000 deaths from traffic accidents uh, per day around the world. And we're not uh, staying inside hiding from cars. So just, like, well, a lot of perspective there. So it's not just the monetary policy that's going to potentially and probably be easing back off the pedal. It's also the economic reopening. So you have names like Chardon. You have names like Royal Caribbean, Delta, Alcoa, Live, Na Duncan. Live Nation, <laughs> Occidental. All of these names that are directly tied to the reopening of the economy. Even MGM. Forget about Las Vegas and Wynn because they're, they're China related. But MGM, the casino stock, the chart looks amazing. Duncan, throw up the next chart showing the Russell 2000 value index versus the NASDAQ 100. Oh, look at this. So there we go. So if you're like one of these people that's like 100% tech, this is not a fun week for you. Chart off. But if, you, but if Wait, your hold, portfolio hold on, let me, let me, has me, like, go ahead. Let me just piggyback. European tech stocks fell 4% today. Worst decline in, I forget, in a long time. Fell 4% today. European tech stocks. Literally, what the hell is a European tech stock? I'm not even making a joke. SAP? But hold on. So Let me US clear my board. I'll get back to you. Communication, <laughs> communication stocks and technology stocks in the United States are 40% of our market. Energy is three percent, so it's nothing. And then in the in in Europe, tech is I'm guessing like fifteen percent, maybe twelve percent. I don't think it's that big. Yo, in the chat, throw up some European uh, tech names for me. I'm sure I know them. I just need my memory job. Uh, Ethereum. No, <laughs> right. Very difficult. So does this have legs? Because the last time Could. we had value and cyclicals rip versus 
technology stocks. It didn't go on forever, but I feel like it was a few months. Throw that chart back on, Dun- uh, Duncan. And, and you the, could Russell really play value. this. So is that just, lasted. Is this just starting? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it looks that looks like a breakout to me. I would ask I would ask JC, but that looks pretty clean. Yeah, this this feels good. So the point I was trying to make earlier is like there are a lot of p- investors, and I think on the younger side, where these stocks were never money makers in the entire time they had been investing, so they don't know about them. Like they they really don't know about oil companies and steel companies, and like it's just not relevant to their world yet. So maybe they'll learn these stocks, and that will provide more fuel for them to keep keep working if value starts to rip these names are going to get the robin uh, investors are going to or traders are going to hop on them they don't care but they're not going to be excited so you saw the breakout in jp morgan this week right jpm i was watching financials yes guilty okay their robin hood crowd is not going to get excited about jp morgan ever it doesn't JP really morgan matter hit, hit an all-time high today 169 a share okay so that's a breakout nice. like an obvious breakout sick nice the Robinhood crowd's not going to pile into that stock. Could they pile into an offshore drilling company that's like a $7 stock that goes to 14 Could they get excited about that? 100%. Could they pile into companies that are cyclical but making like EV battery materials? 100% they could. So How about this? If, w- dry ships, if Dry Ships was, was trading? Is Dry Ships trading anymore? It is so. trading. It is? Okay. One, there's like five of those uh, dry shipping stocks left. Um Take a flyer on those if you think this this uh, cyclical moment has legs. That's all. I, I, I don't follow any of them. I know nothing about it. I'm just going to tell you those will fucking go crazy. All right. So they so, will heavily shorted. So same story. I guess I forgot to update the doc, but let's just talk about volatility. It's it's been a, it's been a minute. It has been a minute. So well, the VIX. What? It has been a minute, but this really started like last week. It's it's not that new. It did. So it's kind of funny if we zoom back. We were pointed to Evergrande as the catalyst, I guess, last Monday. And in fairness, it was. <laughs> it was. But stocks were already buckling prior to Monday. Right. And so we saw we saw the VIX today get up to nothing. All right, this is a joke. The VIX got all the all the way up to 24, 24.8. Did anyone jump off a roof in uh, lower Manhattan or in Greenwich, Connecticut? I mean, I, that's not, I, I feel you know. like I don't. I don't even get out of bed for a VIX under a VIX spike that doesn't make it over thirty or forty. That's so yeah, it's, that's, it's that, very yeah, hard to get excited. That's, that, that's not exciting. Um, right. But if we look at individual names, some of the ones that I've been talking about that are just getting railroaded. Teladoc was three hundred eight in February. Another long duration stock. Teladoc was three hundred eight in February. One twenty nine today. Who just pointed out to me that Arc is still thirty percent above. Uh, it's high print from February. Thirty no, percent is a below thirty. Arcs I'm sorry, 30, did yeah. I say above? Thirty yeah. percent drawdown over seven months. That's a very long time for that fund to be out of favor. How about this? It's and flat it's since to be out of favor. It's flat since December. Uh, yeah. Zoom five ninety down to two sixty. Ouch! Oh, there's no bottom. That um, stock has that stock has no floor. Like a lot of these names look just terrible. Roku looks awful. Zillow looks awful. I mean, you don't have to like search very hard. So I guess the, the, the question is, and we're going to get to this later about the concentration in the market. Now the names are starting to get hit. The, the ones that actually hold up the market. So Apple looks like shit. Amazon looks like shit. Facebook, gross. Google still looks fine, but it's still not big today. Microsoft, free fall. Again, relatively speaking. Um, and so these are the names that move the market. And so if this persists, if interest rates continue to rise, if cases continue to drop, God willing, then we should expect this to continue, you know, maybe. I mean, obviously, this could turn on a dime. Well, but- what what's this? So, like, the index loses ground, but there are a lot of green stocks in sectors that people don't care about. Exactly. So, this is the opposite of what we saw. Where this is yes, hot, though. I kind of like this. I, it's finally. It gives us something to talk about. It's been boring. So, <laughs> the S&P 500 has done well, even with so many stocks getting wrecked. Now, you could see a ton of little names do really well. Which is cool for stock pickers, but yeah. if but if the big five roll over, uh, Occidental and Anadarko could go up fifty x and it wouldn't move. It wouldn't hold up the market. Yeah, they're going to go from one to two percent of the S and P five hundred market cap. The the energy stocks. It's 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 very hilarious how 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 much room there is. Those stocks have been going down 
for I don't years. I don't know. I want to say eight years. <laughs> years. <laughs> Nine years. All right, let's keep it let's keep it moving. We've been on this for a, we've been on this for a minute. Um what are we, what are we, what are we doing after uh after it literally volatility? says it right on the screen. Uh, home sales. So listen, I'm not like a Fed hater. Uh you're a Fed apologist, as we all know, you and no, Ben. No, I'm, Ben is Ben is. I'm like very neutral. I think I think overall they're a force for good, but they move very slowly and they and they always go too far. And what they're doing to the housing market is really counterproductive. Uh, and makes absolutely no sense to anybody that's observing this. Like it, it there's no, there's almost no justification uh, for for what they're doing. These mindless asset purchases, specifically of things like mortgage bonds, which I'm not sure if they're doing anymore. I, I think they, I think or maybe they still bi- are. I think they're still doing forty billion a month. Forty billion. It's <laughs> what? <laughs> I can't understand it. What they're doing is actively harming first-time buyers so if you're really trying to get the economy going hold up that keep, chart i just saw that uh lehman lehman brothers chart off chart off Duncan. chart off he wants to see he wants to see the gear did you get that Le- on instagram lehman brothers stockholders convention 2002 uh actually we have a picture of the back of the shirt uh duncan you have this so this <laughs> this <laughs> this is I saw, a that real, Insta- I, I saw that on Instagram. Did, where, where'd you get that? eleven? This guy at Eleven Wall Street uh, is selling it on Instagram. He sent me one. Okay, so it was a gift. Thank you at Eleven Wall Street. Anybody that wants uh, the official Lehman Brothers two thousand two, this could be you shirt. It is available. Um, go to uh, go to Instagram. Find Eleven Wall Street. Anyway, w- what's going on with ho- home sales is that finally existing home sales have turned negative. Chart on. So this is uh, this is uh, tight supply pushed the medium price of an existing home sold in August to three hundred sixty five thousand seven hundred dollars, an increase of fourteen point nine percent from August of twenty twenty. The median is also being skewed by stronger activity on the higher end of the market. Sales of homes priced below two hundred fifty thousand fell compared with a year ago, while sales of those priced over a million jumped forty percent. First-time buyers are clearly struggling with higher prices, falling to just a 19% share of all sales, the lowest since January 2019, pre-pandemic. Historically, first-time buyers should be 40%. So first-time buyers are now half of the market that they used to be. Uh, The amount, home sales are now going negative. Home prices are up 20% over the last year. So Peter Bookvar has been calling this sticker shock. Yes, there are young people, young families. Yes, they want to buy homes and start their lives. Yes, that is the best form of economic growth in history when many, many young people do household formation. And what the Fed is doing is stopping that process and now officially putting it in reverse. What are your thoughts? I, I mean, I, I agree and I Good disagree. Luck. I think that I agree and I disagree. You have data? Think, hold on. Hold on a second. I okay. think that talking about the real estate market is like talking about the investor. It like it is not homogenous. It is demographically breaking down. I just said it's not. Co- Hold I'm on. only concerned with the, the 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 I'm only concerned Mike with the first time buyer. Continue. Uh what if the first time buyer which normally averages 40% of the market and I don't have the data for this but what if that was 60% of the market all for the last four quarters, five quarters? It's not. But what if it was? So George not. George Perks also did this thing where getting into a $356,000 house, which is the median, meaning half the houses are below $356,000, you don't need a ton of money as a first-time home buyer to put down. I don't know that like first-time home buyers are getting pushed out all the way. Now, first-time home buyers that are trying to buy a uh, what was a $700,000 house that's now 950, yeah, they're fucked. And that's a lot of the that's a lot of the cases of where where you and I live. Okay. This is Case Shiller National Home Price Data S&P CoreLogic Case Shiller, which looks at the 20 most populous cities and their suburban surrounding areas. Uh, the National Home Price Index posted a 19.7% annual gain in July, up from 18.7% gain in June. It was the fourth straight months in which the growth rate set a record. This is fucking stupid. Why do we think it's good for anyone other than 80-year-olds who are selling their house and trading it in 
um, for for assisted living somewhere. Like, why do we think this is helping the economy? It's literally doing the opposite. And when homes at the high end get bumped up like that, it does affect the first time buyer because everybody has to settle for something a little bit shittier for a little bit higher dollar dollar value. It's really it's not benefiting anyone at, at this point, and I think it's slowing down the rate at which we would normally see household formation. I, I can't see how anyone could make the case otherwise. Now, the Fed said they're not going to separate mortgage bond buying from treasury bond buying. So for as long as they're continuing this stimulus, which makes less and less sense with every passing day, they will continue to stimulate the high end of the housing market. Uh, and it seems like this is going to go on for another year. I, can you find a silver lining in that? Like, what's the good part of that? Refis? We did all the refis already. Yeah, I was going to say, that is... That They're none left. If you didn't that, refi by now, hmm. what, what's, what, what are you busy doing? Well, like, you're waiting for the bank to process your refi because they're so freaking behind. So U.S. existing home sales are slowing. They fell 2%. Year over year, I think one and a half percent month over month. So the housing market, even though the data we find out today, by the way, the data that we got today from from uh, uh, the Schiller data, the twenty city data, that's from July. The U.S. Well, home sales is from is from August. So we're talking about different different months. But of yeah, course, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. The housing market is twenty percent is twenty percent. It's enough. Like we don't need house prices to go up thirty percent between the the early last year and the end of this year. So I agree. That, I agree. My, my only point is, and I'm not even pushing back. I'm just making the point that they're like different areas are impacted differently by the, by the national real estate market. When you're so when you're seeing the national median, it's just not the same for everyone. That's all. I don't acknowledge anybody that lives outside of the 20 uh, most popular cities. So okay. I, I, I'm just kidding. All right. Yeah. Got, uh, all what right. Do you got? Um, Michael Sembalist wrote a post on global supply chain. There's a lot of charts in here, so bear with me. Called Dude, Where's My Stuff? And there are disruptions all over the freaking place. Nike is getting, the stock was doing amazing. Now it's rolling over big time. Uh, what normally takes 40 days for sneakers to make their way from Asia to, where's uh, North America? Now it takes 80 days. So let's talk about those, those, uh, those blockages. So Michael yeah. Sembalest wrote, COVID has disrupted supply chains in two major ways. One is surging demand from imported consumer goods in the West due to pandemic work from home trends, home improvement, that sort of stuff, and a decline in, wor in workers required to maintain and operate these supply chains. So show this container freight rate between LA and Shanghai. So Shanghai to Los Angeles, forget about it. And this, oh my the gigantic... The spread in Los Angeles to Shanghai versus Shanghai to Los Angeles is causing this trend to get exacerbated. Why is it like that? Why I'll tell is it you like why. that? I'll tell you okay. why. So Sembla said westbound freight rates haven't risen nearly as much, meaning Los Angeles to Shanghai, um, leading to an odd and problematic phenomenon. Incentives for container owners to move them back to China empty to accelerate receipt of eastbound freight sales. So instead of waiting for containers to be refilled to earn westbound freights as well, they're doing the opposite. So this is just exacerbating the the, the, the issue, the supply chain issues. They're just going back oh, empty so that they can get it back. The, they're sending the boxes back yes. just to get another to get another exactly. run back west. Exactly. So now Dude, that's, that's hilarious. So now look at the next chart. Anchored container ships in Los Angeles and Long Beach ports. I mean Holy shit! It's usually zero. Wait, can you explain this? So these, these are all, these are ships waiting to deliver wait, what they're holding, wait, waiting to unload. What is the y-axis? Number of days. Number, oh, number of, of ships. ships. So really, all you need to know is go to the next chart. Global manufacturer delivery times. You could tell I'm an expert in this, by the way. So Joe, Joe Chartoff, Joe and Tracy had a podcast today with a railroad executive describing what's happening. And the quote was like, the supply chain is only as strong as its weakest link and links are breaking everywhere. So this is not gonna get fixed overnight. Here's a crazy stat that blew my mind. Semiconductors are the world's, world's fourth most traded good after crude oil, refined oil, and cars. Holy shit, semiconductors. So uh, auto consulting firm is now estimating that the semiconductor shortage will cost U.S. auto manufacturers $210 billion this year. $210 billion. 
in January, that number was was uh, 60 billion. They've had to triple the estimate of what they think the semiconductor shortage is going to cost them. So sh show this auto in, chart. In not a long time. This is nuts. So this is the inventory to sales ratio. And literally off the off the page. So spiked, obviously, uh. because there was there was nothing but inventory, right? There's no sales, I should say. And then crashed the other way. Look at dealers. There are no cars. My my lease is up in December. I don't know what I'm gonna do. They're gonna want they're gonna want that car from you. You should call them right now. I yeah. You should call them right now. I should have called them two months ago, but yeah. You should call them right now. Say I have a I have a All lightly right. used uh car. What do you want to do here? Hold on. What what do you want? You, no, I didn't mean like right now, right now. We so that. yeah, issues, issues all over the place, and uh, FedEx is right. having issues. A lot of worker issues aren't coming back. Like there are, you know, you there know are what? issues. The, Go ahead. So pa Powell has had to backtrack a lot of the uh, transitory stuff and just start to admit that there is a component to this that maybe is not being driven by anything the Fed is doing, but is much more like supply related in nature that is going to persist longer than expected. And honestly, there's nothing he can do about it. So buying 40 billion worth of mortgage bonds a month, and then what is it, 80 billion in treasuries, whatever the number is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's not gonna make the ships go faster. It's not gonna make the longshoremen any less grouchy and ornery and, FedEx's and, COO and work quicker. None of that's FedEx gonna happen. FedEx's COO said that a sorting hub in Portland, Oregon had 65% of the workers needed to handle the normal number of packages. The stock got absolutely crowbarred. Uh, the tight labor market added $450 million to cost. Costs are rising everywhere. And then this is inflation. This is, where, this is where inflation comes from. They're passing it on. They're raising rates by 5% to the consumer. You know what's, you know what's so funny? I was, trying to, I was trying to orchestrate a slowdown in a new account onboarding at the firm. Like, because I wanted to make sure we had the right number of people working on each of these cases. And we do now. We hired people. But you were, like, dead set against it. We're lucky we're in a services business. If you and I were in a business where we actually had to make things, put them in boxes, and ship them, that wouldn't have even been a discussion. If I said to you, like, we have to stop taking orders and we have to start telling people you're not getting anything for three months – Okay, what choice it's do we a, have? It's the same thing as FedEx. Let's say that they said, okay, okay, time out, no more orders. So what? You've got 90 days back backlogged of orders that you've no, got to deliver. So it's not no more orders. It's like a uh, two-day delivery is now five-day delivery. Deal with it. So anyway, FedEx was – remember, the FedEx looked amazing back in the first or second quarter. It now went from 221 to 320, a 30% decline. So again – even though the S&P 500 is still near an all-time high, there's stocks all over the place that look horrendous. Now, you can make the case that there was a stealth bear market all under the surface and then, and that we're actually closer to the end than the beginning. It's hard to say that with the S&P 4.5% off the highs. Well, if they hit Apple, Amazon, et cetera, and we have the full-blown 10% good, good. correction and these other stocks are going higher while that's happening, that's good. a very fascinating situation. And maybe that uh, wipes out some of that imbalance in the market from the tech sector to everything else. Like maybe do you think, that, do you that think, corrects do you, a little bit. Do you think that energy stocks can bring balance to the force? No, but I think uh, healthcare can, and I think financial financials can. Like those those sectors, they can get much bigger. Those stocks All can sudden, get much yeah. bigger. All right, so, next, what's up? Uh, Bitcoin banned. China has had enough. Mm. Uh, the fun and games. There was a ton of Bitcoin mining going on in China. I'm sure they were paying very close attention to the economic, uh, the, the environmental impact while that was going on, as they usually do. Uh, there was a lot of Ethereum stuff happening in China, too, and Bitcoin Cash and a lot of fun and games and a lot of people moving money out of the Chinese financial system via crypto. And in stages, they have been shutting that down. And finally, last week, they said no more. No it's over. And Ron and Sana, I thought, did a very good piece for CNBC. All crypto people will disagree with that. But he's saying if China can do it, anyone can do it. And if China wants to do it, they won't be the only country no, that wants to do no, it. No, no. If China can do it, not anyone can do it. That's nonsense. What do you mean? China, it, China operates their country, maybe you've noticed, a little bit differently than, say, other democracies. Because China's not uh one. Yeah, I agree. But you don't think Singapore could do this if they want to? Do you know that they cane you if you drop a piece of gum on the sidewalk? 
Do you know if you vandalize uh, All right, it's enough. a piece you, of you, someone's property, you literally could be like China's executed? Only, I'm not saying China's the only country that can do it. But and they probably won't be the last. But so what? You don't think Australia can say, "Well, China's our biggest trading partner, and there's a lot of cross currents with our two economies, and we don't want this shit here either." I I think you're I think you're un, underestimating uh, the desire for com- countries to gain control over what their citizens are doing with money, uh, regain control actually in the case of China. So I don't think they will be the only country, and maybe they get beat. Maybe the crypto guys keep running, you know, end runs around uh, everything they're trying to do. But it's an interesting concept, I think, that this could happen in the second largest economy in the world. Well, I, I do think it's happening now. I, this is not going out on a limb. I do think that regulation is like the billion, trillion, quadrillion dollar question with with cryptocurrencies. Um, this is going to be unpopular. Stable coins are basically unregulated money market funds. Change my mind. Okay, no, that's actually very, that's consensus. That's not unpopular. That's exactly Okay, do you know why money market, let me finish. Do you know why money market funds have regulation? Why? Because people use them in lieu of cash. And as a result, there should be some oversight over what's in them so that widows and orphans don't end up uh, literally having their, what they thought was risk-free money get completely blown up. And that has happened. That has happened. In the past with money market funds uh and it could certainly happen again especially with vehicles that are two or three years old and nobody watching what do you, i'm not what are a tinfoil i'm not a tinfoil hat wearer, I. but i do think i will put my tinfoil hat on i do think that uh gensler's biggest worry rightfully so is that the public at large discovers stable coins and earned products and if they know Hey, wait a minute. I can just move my money from here to there and get eight and a half percent, or I could keep it in the bank earning 10 basis points. Why am, Why would I not put it there? So I do think that they are very, destabil- very, very- could destabilize the entire, the entire country if that process happens faster than anyone is ready for it. I mean, there's 11 trillion. I don't know how many trillions in money market accounts. There's so much money. Oh, if- not a lot. It's like 40 trillion. Not yeah, much. So- so even if like a hundred, <laughs> even if like a hundred billion went over, I mean, whatever. I think I think stable coins, the earned products, are the gateway drug into crypto. So I think that they are very, very, very uh, worried about that. That's what they should be. So that's such a great point that you made. I think that trading, trading uh, Bitcoin and other and other instruments is the gateway drug for young people. Stable coins is the gateway drug for like old rich people. And institutions and I guess my question to you is based on everything you've read about how these work and I know that you know more than I do um, about the mechanics underlying these I know you've had a lot of high-level calls with some very high-level crypto people Um, based on everything you know if there were some type of a rush by the masses into stable coins wouldn't the yields decline like by definition because there would be more money and not enough uh, farming slash mining opportunities or whatever, or does yeah, it you, not work that way? Yeah. So how much is locked up in stable coins right now? Is it is it eighty billion? I don't know what the number is, but certainly there are only so many opportunities. Whatever for the reported to, number is, it's bigger. But okay. there are only so many opportunities for this money to be lent, and only so much demand. So I do think that more money coming in would 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 suppress yields. But so, so what? Then why are these people so what? Promoting? Like they, they, so wait, they go wait, from eight out. to six, eight to five. So, who cares? So if you're the genius that figured out you put a million dollars into stable coins uh, last year and you just earned 8% on your million dollars or more, if you are that genius, why are you promoting this? Why do you who's want pro- other people to do that? That 8% will be seven in five seconds. Who are you talking I, to? Who's, who's promoting that? Uh, people that, people are, that are in this realm, in this universe, they can't wait to tell everybody else how smart they are and that everyone else should follow them into it. Like, I feel like, doesn't that take the opportunity away? Why are people being so promotional? Um, is there another angle that I'm not thinking? I don't know, of? but are we're getting selling this the, as a service. The thing is, I do think that that is Gensler's biggest concern with these stable coins and with the, with the yield products in particular. All right, keeping it moving. The digital dollar from the Fed, which the Fed now very openly is discussing the experiments they're carrying out and 
all of their uh, researching that they're doing on the topic. I think this is so besides the point. Nobody gives a shit about digital currencies because people aren't using all of these cryptos to transact anyway. They're not using them for currencies. So I don't view well, this as like- they are, a but they're using them to acquire other crypto-based things. Fine. So yeah, they so are. I don't- I don't view central bank currencies as a threat to crypto. Okay, but if you're bullish on DeFi, then you think that the X trillion dollars a year spent on financial services should be a much lower number because there's going to be this decentralization and this murdering of the middleman. Um, everything that I hear being made as a claim about what DeFi can do for finance, and a lot of it is really exciting, I feel like can be half of the, those things could be done with uh, a, a no US way. dollar digitized. No way. So Kevin no? Rose Kevin Rose had a podcast today with a guy who is making a token to lend money to people to take out a mortgage. And so instead of the instead of you lending the money to the bank, um getting 10 basis points, the bank lending it out three and a half basis points or four, right. I'm sorry, three and a half or four percent, taking the spread for mortgages, this is now going to be in the in the protocol and now the users are going to get paid. So the people are going to replace the, the banks. The I lender is the, is the so everybody the can be a mini. Everybody can yes. be a mini bank. Yes. And what do we do? What do we do about uh, the risk? What do we do about people not paying it back? Not paying what their mortgage? That's why you. That's why you pull the risk. Okay, but fine. So, but the pool is going to get hit at some point with with losses. Okay, so what? So the stock. So the stocks. So then, what happens? The price of the, I don't know, man. The I just, token I just, I just, adjusts I just lower. To- I just listened I, to a podcast. This sounds like being a shareholder in a bank to me. So Yeah, except you're getting paid. I'm getting paid right now. I'm a shareholder in multiple banks. I'm getting paid. Uh, you, you wouldn't get it. I, I guess I wouldn't. <laughs> uh, Jamie Dimon is not going to allow any of this shit to happen anyway. All right, next. What do you got? <laughs> He's not. I'm telling you right now. There's just not a chance. He's not going to allow it. Uh, sorry, what's next? Um, <laughs> where is this? I did, a, da- so- a dangerous man. This clip was... Oh Dangerous my god. Thing. This was scary to me to watch. This is some, really, really bad. Really, way. really, really bad. Elizabeth Warren said, um she she I said the, so I put the she, I put the quote here. She's talking about Jerome Powell, who as far as I think most people are concerned, is pretty much straight down the middle, does not seem to have a political agenda, as far as I can tell. Um so far, you've been lucky that there hasn't been a financial crisis. Your record gives me grave concern. You are a dangerous man to have the Federal Reserve. She said to his face, uh, credit to her. She's not doing this on MSNBC. No subtweets. No subtweets. No. I appreciate that. Yeah, no subliminals. She went right up at his grill and said, renominating you means gambling. That for the next five years, a Republican chair who has regularly voted to deregulate Wall Street won't drive this economy over a cliff again. And she called him a dangerous man like twice. And uh, he basically said capital in the largest banks is at multi-decade highs, lady. And uh, and she's like, well, Fed research showed that the biggest banks avoided $300 billion in losses due to the government's broader economic policy response to the pandemic. Obviously, that was the, <laughs> that was the point. That's I one. Mean- and, then, and then he said back. Which they would have been able to absorb without difficulty. That I'm not so sure of. But just this this idea that she wants a Fed chair who thinks their job is to worry about the rainforests in Latin America or to focus on like racial issues and, and all this progressive stuff. This is the such whole, a turn off. It's gross because the whole reason he's been successful in in the rescue that he pulled off last year is because he doesn't have people pointing fingers at him that he's not wearing the uniform of one of these two uh, asshole teams. He's not waving a Republican flag or a Democrat flag every time he does something. He's being a technocrat, which you need technocrats in this role. Nothing could be worse than putting a communist in this role or putting you know so, somebody who... Uh, is is subservient to the Koch brothers. Like that's not like what, what we need here. When she came on the scene, a lot of her ideas about regulation like were grounded in reality and probably good for the consumer. And she's yes. gone so, 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 so far over I don't know what edge, but the edge. And now it's just like hard to take her seriously when she's saying things like this. Like the 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 Fed the Fed should be as involved as every other branch of of finance and government should be involved in things that 
obviously uh, concern us all like the environment up until a point. That's not part of the Fed's mandate. And they frankly, they don't have the tools to solve that. The Fed can't end racism. Mm. The Fed can't does. Now, you have a situation where they want to politicize this. I'm not quite sure why, um, but like this is like worse than what this is as bad as what Trump was doing. Trump would take these parts of government that are not political or not partisan. They were just there to function, and he would turn them partisan and political. In yeah, my mind, dang- what she's doing is dangerous. What she's doing is just trying, as bad. Trying to undermine the Fed is, is dangerous. There's enough of that. Uh, I heard, though, in fairness to her, Jerome Powell's fists are registered as lethal weapons uh, in 27 states. He does strike me as highly dangerous. So you know, maybe- there was there was stories that Ken Shamrock that that was like a real thing. Was that like just a myth? Was that like an urban legend? They because they used to say it about Bruce Lee, so it's, it's a lie. Uh, Nobody's fists are registered as lethal. <laughs> registered with who? <laughs> where, do, where do you do that? The fucking post office. That's that was always like that was always like uh, the kid who ate pop rocks and drank Coca Cola and his head exploded. That was one of those kind of urban myths. All right, let's uh, let's bring in Duncan. I think uh, I think we've done enough on uh, E War and Jay Pal. Uh, Duncan, hey what's going on? How's it going? Great. You got uh, viewer topics for us tonight? Yeah, I do. Sorry, my lighting looks kind of weird here. The sun just like went away here, and uh, that's okay. In you will York. be dealt with later. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so first up, we have Todd who writes. I've always heard, and I should I should preface this with we've gotten this question uh, before in different forms. So I, I is think it Todd Bridges? This. Uh, it could be. Who knows? Okay. But uh, so Todd writes. I've always heard that you should make sure any financial advisor you hire is a fiduciary, so that they have to do what's in your best interest. But what does that actually mean? What does it take to become a fiduciary? Do they need a certain degree or certification? Do they swear like a lawyer to uphold the best interest of their client, or is it just a position that an employer puts them in? As an investor, how do I know beyond just asking if they are a fiduciary and trusting the answer? So I would send you to get the exact definition, like to the letter of the law, I would send you to sec.gov and the Securities and Exchange Commission actually will break down the specifics. But as a generalization, because I don't want you guys to turn off my YouTube and go read a government website, um, there is there are two standards of care now in the financial uh, advisory space. There is what's called the best interests standard, which is relatively new. I think it does an okay job. They're basically (laughs) making brokers, people who sell investments, including insurance, but especially mutual funds, et cetera, hold hold themselves up to a standard that every time they ask a client to enter into a transaction, it's in the client's best interest. Of course, if they're selling a share mutual funds, it's not, but that's a whole other conversation. What if they hold that Fiduciary is a higher standard of care. Fiduciary is literally, I have minimized every potential conflict possible, and I don't get paid differently for recommending one product or action versus another. Like completely flatten the potential for conflicts. So in other words- That's the simplest definition. How do you get paid? yeah, so another right. So in other words, if Michael is my client, if BlackRock is paying me the same if I'm being paid by Michael the same amount if I put him in a BlackRock fund or a Vanguard fund, that that gets me closer to being a fiduciary. I don't have any conflicts and only Michael is paying me. No other companies are paying me. So that is, I think, what you're looking for for the most part when you want financial advice. There are some cases where a broker is is a better fit, primarily if you're making all the decisions, then you don't need to pay somebody for advice. But I would highly recommend consuming content from the SEC on this topic and and uh, really getting a a, 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 a more in depth answer. Uh, what's okay, next? I would just I, I would just send you to TikTok instead. But okay, what's next? <laughs> so one one uh, one follow up on that: Is there like a way that people can look and see? Because I, I, I kind of get the feeling that's what some people are wondering too. The easy, I think Michael said it right. The easiest way is to figure out how people get paid. Okay. So if they are a broker and they're registered with FINRA, they're held to the best interest standard. And if they are an, uh, an investment advisor or an RIA, uh, then they are held to the fiduciary standard. 
There are a lot of people in our industry that wear both hats and switch off. It's legal. Um, it's very controversial. Michael Kitsis is currently uh, fighting a lawsuit to put an end to that. But like just, that is just, a yeah. We talked about this last week. Yeah, yeah. yeah basically, 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 if a third party is paying your advisor, your bro, your financial guy, if a third party is paying, if a product is being pay, is and you're paying, not, then they're not acting th as a then fiduciary for you. Usually, usually they're not a fiduciary. Not always, but usually. That's a fair. That's a fair generalization. Next. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so uh, up next, we have a question from Shrey who writes. Uh, through all of the great performance of the S&P 500 and NASDAQ 100, if we remove the top 10 companies from each of these indexes, uh, how would the returns look? And what if we remove the bottom 10% of companies? Would the returns be enhanced? Is there an argument for a passive investing strategy that caters to this dynamic? I just I thought of Michael... getting out. Oh, yeah. Sorry. What? Sorry, uh, I thought the question was over. Go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to say, they, they mentioned that you and Ben had, had mentioned this on uh, Animal Spirits recently, but they wanted a deeper take. I don't okay, understand I the question. I don't understand I, I the do. question. I do. Okay. I just thought of a good analogy. If you take LeBron and AD off the Lakers, they suck. But if you take their, I don't know who their 11th or 12th guy are. If you take them off the team, you probably wouldn't notice. So right. what I mean by that is this, the, the S&P 500, it's a market cap weighted index. It oh, this is always true. It's always true that if you take away the best performing stocks, you know, the Lakers are, usually, are a, the, the Lakers are not a great example for this. They're, yeah, they are. Like their worst guy is like uh, their their tenth guy is like uh, pretty good. Mellow, like, whatever, fine. Rajon but, Rondo. Okay, Microsoft and Alphabet. Each Microsoft has con contributed 150 basis points to the return of the S and P 500 year to date. Google contributed. Oh, it's broken. Google contributed uh, 170. We so have those, this table. table so those, on. those those two stocks alone. I don't think I think I put this in late. Those two stocks alone contributed three percent, okay? Because they're the biggest stocks, and they happen to be very high-performing stocks. On the flip side, if you look at the worst, the biggest detract, the biggest detractors from from, from the S and P five hundred, the worst offender is Qualcomm. Okay, Qualcomm is a is down fourteen percent year to date, but it's not a four percent position in the S and P. So it's what the taken hell is a wrong with what the hell is wrong with that stock? By the way, it's a semiconductor stock. In 2021, no, I think down it's, I think it's like 14%. Percent. I know weird. what it is. Um, no, weird. I know you know what it is, but I feel like it's like a, in, in, in m and rumors all the time. Um, Trash. So Qualcomm has taken, it's the biggest detractor from the S&P 500 year to date. It's taken off seven basis points. That's nothing. So my po it's, it's, it's a joke. So my point is, unless the entire market goes down, it always is this way, that the biggest winners move the needle, the biggest detractors don't. However... If you can own the index in an equally weighted way, for example, and remove the bottom 50% of performers, and you can't, but if you could, that would juice the shit out of returns, obviously. What, if we got rid of the losers? Yeah. So is if that you had better, like, is, that, is, that, is, that, is that more impactful, though, if you got rid of the winners? I don't think so. So if you, start off, if you were to equal weight the index, and, yeah. you, and you took away the top 10% of winners versus yeah. the bottom 10% of losers, the impact... Usually, I think, is that getting rid of the losers would juice the returns more than getting rid of the winners with oh, the from returns. If you so were then, to equal weight it, if you were to equal weight them. So that's an argument then in favor of saying, like, it's not that important how big these stocks are. Uh, if you're, if so there's, there's actually an ETF that tried to do this. It's called the Tickers X Out. That's not a recommendation. Um, where they try and remove the worst performing stocks and, and cap, I think cap weight the rest. And they've done very well, like compared compared to the what markets. Is it called? Inception. X out. X out. How often are they like saying pull I for, these I forget, loser stocks I forget, out? I forget the fine print. I bet you it's got to be monthly. I forget the they methodology. Gotta be, they got to be looking at like the the worst performing stocks and then culling them. But it's like impossible uh, to predict the worst. It's a momentum stocks strategy because they change all the time. Yeah, no, they're looking in the in the rearview mirror, but it's a momentum strategy. That's, that sounds interesting. I didn't even know that existed. Who makes that? Do we know? We know the guy. Um, uh, Will Ryan Granite shares in part in oh. partnership with somebody else. Hugh Grant, I love I, that guy. Dude, we're on this. He, I, he I really want, looks. He looks like Hugh Grant, dude. I saw some. Speaking of, I saw something Notting Hill last night. I can't watch a mm. movie enough. So, so I love a good love story. You're so romantic. All right, really and am. you are, and you are a dangerous man when it comes to Notting Hill. So for, first things first, <laughs> let me just say this: you guys, you guys got us over eighty thousand subscribers. This week, do you have a round of applause ready? Do you, what do we have? Do you have balloons you could drop on me? Holy shit. 
Do you know how many people, 80,000 people is? It's like is Giant that, Stadium. Is that Giant Stadium? Is that Madison Square Garden four times? Do yes. I have that right? Yeah. Guys, we love you. Thank you so much for subscribing, for telling your friends about us, for showing up for the live premiere of What Are Your Thoughts every Tuesday, watching Animal Spirits, watching The Compound and Friends. You guys are awesome. We love it. And uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, I don't know what you, you want to be in the first 100,000. Believe me. Believe me. You want to be able to tell people. We're going to give out you governance were, tokens. We're calling you guys Generation Zero. Everybody that got in before the first 100,000. Because there's only one way to go, and it's up. And you know this. All right. Smash that like button if you haven't already. Tell your friends about the show. Uh, make sure you check out. Uh, the all new Animal Spirits tomorrow. If you want to have a topic featured and what are your thoughts, hit us at askthecompoundshow at gmail.com or hit the link below. We love you guys. Thanks, Y Charts. We will see you next week. <laughs>